And good morning, everybody. Welcome this morning. Great to see you here at your community church. Um, thank you for turning out on this beautiful day. It's good to see so many. And if you're joining us online at the moment, great to have you with us. But if it's later when you catch up, thank you for doing that. And we really pray that God will just bless you as we know he's going to bless us here at uh, Burn Home. Uh, for those of you who don't know, my name's Ian. It's great to just play a very small part in the service this morning where Becky will be speaking to us later. Becky's one of our church leaders. We're continuing the series on the life of Joseph, the forgiving prince, and the topic this morning is a ruling prince. So we're looking forward to what Becky has to say to us. But before we uh, just start, I'd like to read a psalm uh, just to give us a point of focus. Um, a very familiar psalm, perhaps the most familiar psalm. I suspect an awful lot of people in the room can recite this psalm by memory. Um, but because we know it so well, sometimes we, we don't read it in church, we don't do it. Let me just read the 23rd psalm for you. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and staff comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. <laughs> Some great truths uh, just to settle our minds at the beginning of this service. I don't know what your week's been like, uh, whether you've been in green pastures or whether you've been in the shadows in a valley. But isn't it great that God has assured us that wherever we are, he is with us. And his goodness and love goes with us. And the future is secure and it's positive. And we are just going to praise God this morning um, as we come. We want to worship and give thanks to a God who's relevant, a God who cares, and a God who's promised he will walk with us through life. Thank you, band. Would you like to stand as you're able?
Great. Thank you. Please take your seats. My chains are gone. I've been set free. I hope that's something that the, all of us in this hall this morning will know before the, the morning's out. So before we go any further, let's just continue. Let's just pray um, for our time together. Father, we just come this morning. We're conscious that we come into the presence of an almighty God. We thank you for who's just sung about the great things that you have done and that you are both relevant and real. We thank you that you created this earth and not only did you create it, you sustain it day in, day out. And Father, we just ask this morning that in our time together, through your Holy Spirit, that you will speak to us either individually or to a church group as a, as a whole. Father, help us to just be receptive to what you have to say. And whilst we are able to come here this morning with no limitations and enjoying many blessings, we're so conscious that there are many areas of conflict in the world around us. We pray for those situations. We pray for those who seek to bring peace and relief into areas where there isn't the many things that we have and take for granted often. And for our own country, we just pray blessing upon us. Father, we pray for our government, both national and local. We pray for those who make decisions for the future. We ask that you would be real, that you would prompt, that you would be in those decisions for the future of our own country. And this morning, Father, we just pray, as Becky comes and speaks to us, that you'd really just be with her, help her to express the thoughts that you've given to her during the week. We pray for the creche and for the children and the young people as they go to their various groups. We just pray that what they learn and what they pick up from you will be real, that it'll make a real difference. It'll be something that they talk about after they've finished this morning. Father, just be with us, we pray, in your name. Amen. Good. Okay. Um, just in terms of knowing what goes on at YCC, no doubt everybody has had uh, the weekly list, the weekly notice sheet. If you haven't, um, then the Connect Point will, or somebody hanging around, will point you in the right direction. Um, and no doubt, not only having received it, you've all read it, so uh, there's no point to go through uh, in detail what was in that news sheet. I see I've got competition this morning. No? <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. Um, one thing I want to just highlight, Lucy. Hello. So, thank you. Um, yeah, I just wanted to highlight that this evening at Cornerstone at 7 till 9 p.m., we are holding a songwriting session. Um, we've had a couple of these in the past. Um, something we were inspired initially as a worship team um, by going to one of the Pioneer conferences to start because um, there's something really powerful about writing worship songs that we can sing as a congregation about what God is doing in our congregation, not as well as what he's doing in other churches around the world. Um, but I just wanted to make it a bit more well known now um, to say that everyone is welcome. You don't need any sort of songwriting or even necessarily musical experience before. Um, yeah, everyone will, will bring different things. Um, some people will bring the ideas or the scripture or other people will bring the chords, the music, the tunes or the lyrics. Um, so yeah, if you're interested in coming but aren't quite sure and you've got any questions, come and speak to me after the service. Um, and if you've already come, I'll just highlight as well that um, I've sent an email out um, with a shared Google Drive to put any of our uh, recordings or lyrics or anything in to make the organisation a bit easier for each evening that we do it. Um, yeah, so it's two months on and two months off, so we're holding it this month and next month, and then we won't hold it again in the last Sunday of each month. I hope that made sense. But yeah, tonight at Cornerstone. Please come along. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just a couple of other things to mention. Um, student lunch 
Uh, today's it Pete and Jen Drings, I think, and ably supported by the marshal. So students do have a word with Peter Jen to get the details uh, of that. Just in the notice sheet, if you haven't read it, it is worth reading because there are opportunities flagged up there for people to get involved in church. Um, read it. There's an opportunity for a one-off event coming up soon. There's an opportunity for um, an advisor, uh, I think employed by Citizens Advice to support Food Bank. So that's a bit more of a, uh, a long-term commitment, but that's there. The details are on the sheet. So please do read it um, and uh, act as appropriate. Now, for something uh, a little bit special, Nikki. Don't normally do that, that was weird. <laughs> Morning, everyone. Um, yeah, just a couple of things from me, I guess. One from church leaders, just, um, well, two things, actually. Mark is watching online. Get well soon, Mark. It's his birthday today. Should we all say happy birthday? Happy birthday, Mark! Bless him. Mark's been holding together our staff team, um, as we know, for quite a while now, and um, they've just been really struggling with uh, chest infection and just, yeah, been unwell since the new year, and it, it it keeps coming back, so we're giving him two proper weeks off and just really praying that, uh, yeah, that he'll get back, back to full strength. So do join us in, in praying for that. The good news is, as, as we, was we put out in another email this week, that the cavalry arrive next, um, next weekend. So James Simister, do pray for him and his family who will be saying goodbye to their churches this weekend. And he comes to join us as our minister with responsibility for outreach from next Sunday. So we'll be praying for him next Sunday. So that's really exciting. And Ness and Mark, we've been celebrating with them along the way, haven't we? But Ness is due to come back from maternity leave also very shortly, basically from after next week. So uh, that's really exciting too. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm here this morning actually. If I'm going to invite Wendy up to come and, and share with us. Um, so it's really good to share testimony and to just share what, what God is doing and has done in, in our lives. Um, a few weeks ago, we were talking about you know, God speaking to us and, and when he speaks what we do with that, whether we share it with one another, whether we share it with an individual, whether we have a word with ourselves. And, and Wendy talked to me after the service and we said it would be really good just to hear a little bit of, of the way that the Lord has spoken to Wendy at, at a particular time and, and um, how that has unfolded. So Wendy, we're here to talk about York Neighbours. Can you tell us what York Neighbours is? Yes, so York Neighbours is a charity that was born out of the church um, and Dave Caswell, um, some of you may know um, from One Voice, became chair. Um, and they are a charity that help people over the age of 65 in practical and with emotional support. Um, they have currently, it's been running for 12 years now, and they have 529 older people who we call neighbours and 76 volunteers. Wow. wow, so that's people who get help as older people and people who offer support for particular needs. And, and how did that come about then? Um, in 2012, I was working um, as an information and support worker with the Stroke Association. My job was to visit people who had had a stroke when they were in hospital and then to follow them up for approximately a year afterwards at home. And I was seeing a lot of particularly older people, perhaps in their late 70s, 80s, 90s, who'd had a stroke. Um, and one day I visited um, a lady who said she wished she'd died when she had the stroke um, because she had had a light bulb go in her room and she couldn't do anything about it and there was no one to help her. And uh, she hadn't known what to do and just had to wait till somebody arrived. Um, somebody else said um, they could go weeks, maybe even months, without seeing anybody or hearing from anybody. Um, and his fear was, you know, what, what if I died, how long would it be before, etc. Um, and then um, another lady, it was her birthday when I went. And uh, she was saying to me, I used to have a lot of friends. I had family. It's my birthday today and I don't have one card. Um, and um, somebody else, um, 
Oh, yes, she'd been born um, at the seaside. She was living in York, but she loved to go back to the seaside. And she said to me, life isn't worth living if I can't get to see the sea. So by then, I'd had enough. <laughs> it was very difficult. And one day, I got, after one of these visits, I got into the car and I said to God, God, this is terrible. I can't stand it any longer. You have to do something. And for the first time in my life and since, I heard the audible voice of God. We had a testimony to that a few weeks ago. And he said to me, I want you to do it. <laughs> had you or anyone else come up and asked me to do it, I would have said, there's no way I can do it. I've got two jobs. Um, we need the money. Colin had been made redundant and was working in his own business. But the audible voice of God helps a lot. <laughs> And it was wonderful. It was just like having somebody sit in the car with me. I felt a physical presence. And I would say in the next hour, virtually the entire organisation came as a vision to me. And I said, I need to give my job up. God's asked me to do this. I told him what had happened. And he's like, yep, yeah, OK. <laughs> um, so that's, that's how it happened. And people, some people were very interested in how this had happened afterwards. So I did give it some thought. And I just wanted to share with you, really, that I think what happened was it was the, nothing to do with me. It was the compassion. And I think God, well, I know, God is trying to talk to us every day about these situations. And so if you're feeling, God, something's got to be done about this, just be careful what you say. <laughs> That's amazing, Wendy. Brilliant. Thank you for sharing. And it's grown from strength to strength. And it's really, yeah, yeah. wonderful organisation. Still, still happening. So how can we get involved in Young Neighbours? One thing I did just mean to say, sorry, was the good thing as well about God speaking that clearly to me was it never felt my responsibility. It was something of a nightmare, as Colin will tell you, for the first year or so. Um, and it was hard work, but it never felt my responsibility. And at one point, we were um, almost out of money and just employing our first paid worker. And I can honestly tell you, I was not worried. I knew that God had spoken and this was going to happen. Uh, and that's wonderful. <laughs> and um, sure enough, somebody, one of our volunteers... Um, had inherited some money and just turned up and said, I want to give you this lump sum. So amazing. So how you can get involved is if you're over 65 and you're ever stuck for practical jobs or you feel you'd like someone to ring and chat every now and again, whatever, please do sign up. You can think of it as an insurance policy. You might not need it today, but if you're already signed up, you can ring and ask for a job any time. So why not sign up? That's what we say to people. Volunteers, you're all sitting thinking, no way have I got time to volunteer. When God spoke to me, we set it up so that you can volunteer once or twice a year, and that's fine. So once you've had your police check and you've done your initial training, which is what it used to be, I'm, not, I'm a volunteer now but not involved, it used to be just a couple of hours of the basics, um, then you can be on a list and all that happens is you'll get an email. So if you're busy, you don't have to even read that there's this poor 98-year-old who's desperate and you think, oh, I feel so guilty. Just don't open the email if you're in a bad place. <laughs> you don't have to open it. You can see the title. But if you open it, it might just be one of these people or somebody like them who lives just round the corner to you who just wants a light bulb changing. When I got the vision, I couldn't see why virtually every Christian wouldn't sign up. And the vision was to have a neighbour almost in every street. Been a very disappointing response. And I have to say, probably more volunteers from out of the church than in it. So it's not a tie. It's just you get an email and you think, yep, yeah, I could do that. So please, if you think you can, so you, the, they do small practical one-off jobs, so like changing a light bulb, a drawer that's collapsed, a blind's fallen down, they need their curtains taken down to be washed. <laughs> Individual and group outings, so one lady, she wanted to visit her husband at, at the graveside and couldn't, didn't have any way of getting there. 
because she needed someone with her. They're particularly in need of drivers at the moment. And again, this isn't a weekly thing. It's, yes, I could take that person wherever. Or, yes, I can go to the Bloom Tree with a group of people and have a free lunch. <laughs> um, and then the regular phone calls. And students in particular, often get, they often get involved in the office ringing um, the neighbours. So, sorry, I've probably gone no, too long. That's brilliant. Thanks, Wendy. Okay, so there are cards on the welcome desk if people yeah, want to know more, and Wendy will be around later. Let's pray for York neighbours uh, before, before you go. But I think, yeah, Wendy explained it to me that you're not the only person who gets the email. Lots of people get the email, and then just one person needs to respond to that email for the help to come. Um, but what an opportunity for people to not feel lonely, abandoned, and in despair, and for people to make connections, yeah, and be able to reach out with... Just those, the, yeah, those gentle offers of love and support. So, Lord, we do just lift to York, York neighbours to you, Lord. We thank you so much for giving Wendy this vision and for the ministry and provision that York neighbours is seeking to provide to the people of York. And, Lord, we know it's in your heart for people not to be lonely and in despair. And, Lord, we know that your heart is full of compassion. So, Lord, would you stir us up? Lord, thank you for this example of you working, of you speaking. Help us, Lord, to play our part in bringing your kingdom here to this earth and to this city. Yeah, so we commit York neighbours and ourselves to you again, Lord. And we pray in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. Thanks, Wendy. Brilliant. Yeah, wonderful. Thanks, Wendy. Um, now time for Kairos and Kresh to leave us. Um, as they leave us, a uh, chance just to have a quick chat with anybody nearby or roundabout. Um, once Kairos have left, uh, then the band will lead us in worship. And during the first song of the worship, we'll take up our offering. So the offering bag will go round for those who choose to give uh, in cash into a bag, many give in other means, but this is just one way of contributing to the, uh, the work of the church. So uh, once everybody's gone, then the band can take over. Thank you. Stand as you're able.
thank you that whatever the, whole, the future holds, we can trust you. We can trust that you will be with us, that your spirit is in us, that you will guide us. I'm just going to leave a little bit of space now before we sing the next song. Um, just bring those things to, to Jesus, those things that are hard to trust him with, the things that are making you feel worried for the future. And bring them to him, knowing that we can trust him with them. Knowing that he has the future. He's bigger than time. Even when we don't feel it. Let's just spend a moment bringing those things to him. Thank you, Father, for yeah, <laughs> the fact that you've got all these things, the things that you've just heard us bring to you. Thank you that you've spoken to us. I just encourage you as well, um, if God said something to you then which you think will benefit the congregation, please do bring that to the front. Have a word with Becky or Ian at the front or Nikki. Um, and you can share that with the wider church. Thank you, Father, that your death means that <laughs> these things can be placed in your hands and we can trust you. You died for our freedom. You don't want us to be bound by the fear of what's to come. Amen.
dear T for 12, you may depart for your provision in joy. Um, as we were worshipping, a couple of words come from uh, the congregation, which is beautiful. So to be honest, if you don't listen to anything that's written in this blue book, l- listen to what God's speaking to us. Um, you know all around York, old buildings are coming down, new ones are going up. And we've sung about the newness that we have in Jesus and that feeling that he wants to say to us, You're, the old building that is you, you don't need to live in that anymore. I'm building you a brand new building, your new life. Come and live in that. Don't, don't sneak back to the old one. It might feel more comfortable, but it's coming down and there's a new building coming. And more widely, the green shoots of hope Uh, across the whole world. We've prayed for some really dark times this morning across the world. We've heard about some of the difficulties of um, older folks in our own community. But God says, watch out for what I'm doing. There are green shoots out there. There is hope and it is in my kingdom. So don't despair. Look for those green shoots and keep praying into them. And the two people who've brought me those words, if that doesn't resonate with what you thought you were saying to me, you come back and find me later and I'll um, apologise and uh, you can say it properly. Uh, But that's what I felt God was saying. So, good morning, YCC. Uh, My name's Becky, um, one of the church leaders, as said. um, If you're watching online, particularly you in Cotmanthorpe who've said you're going to be watching me, thanks. Um, You're very welcome to our service. Um, Good to be with you. So to start off with, we are going to look at what God's word says about Joseph. So we are looking at the forgiving prince, which is the title that the story of Joseph is given in this excellent tome, the Jesus Storybook Bible. And we have available for you this morning, if you are a parent or a godparent of somebody small who you know does not have this book... It is such a beautiful way of seeing how God's overarching picture of redemption and blessing and good things in the world is seen from the right at the beginning all the way through to the end of the Bible. If you struggle to find that in a Bible that looks more like a Bible, read this to your kids and it will make a lot of sense. Um, So there's three of them up here. Grab them if you haven't got one already or you think your small people would appreciate it. Um, So, previously on The Forgiving Prince, the story so far. So, Joseph has, as a young man, received prophetic dreams. He's been thoroughly irritating about them and annoyed his family to the point where they sell him as a slave. Notice the directions of the arrows. Then, when the place where he is sold as a slave, he works really hard and he gets promoted within that household. Sadly, he is falsely accused, as we have heard in previous weeks, by the wife of the man who he was working for, and he is thrown into jail, where he works hard. Notice the direction of the arrows again. And he has been promoted. Jolly good stuff. And from there, we keep going up and up. So we heard last week about how there was a prophetic dream or two given in the prison where he was working, being imprisoned, and he, through God's power, was able to interpret that dream, and through that, was able to interpret prophetic dreams for Pharaoh, the head of Egypt. And not only that, but he proposed a solution for that prophetic famine, that famine that was foretold. So this is where we find ourselves, and I'm going to sit down for a couple of minutes, and you get to listen to the dulcet tones and vocal stylings of Mandy Noble as she is going to come and read it for us. Thank you, Mandy. Uh, You want that thing? So Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his finger and put it on Joseph's finger. He dressed him in robes of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. He had him ride in a chariot as his second in command and people shouted before him, make way. Thus he put him in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, 
I am Pharaoh, but without your word, no one will lift a hand or foot in all of Egypt. Pharaoh gave Joseph the name Zaphonath Paneah and gave him Asenath, daughter of Potiphar, priest of On, to be his wife. And Joseph went throughout the land of Egypt. <laughs> Joseph was 30 years old when he entered the service of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from Pharaoh's presence and traveled throughout Egypt. During the seven years of abundance, the land produced plentifully. Joseph collected all the food produced in those seven years of abundance in Egypt and stored it in the cities. In each city, he put the food grown in the fields surrounding it. Joseph stored up huge quantities of grain like the sand of the sea. It was so much that he stopped keeping records because it was beyond measure. Before the years of famine came, two sons were born to Joseph by Asenath, daughter of Potiphar, priest of On. Joseph named his firstborn Manasseh and said, It is because God has made me forget all my trouble and all my father's household. The second son he named Ephraim and said, It is because God has made me fruitful in the land of my suffering. The seven years of abundance in Egypt came to an end and the seven years of famine began, just as Joseph had said. There was famine in all the other lands, but in the whole land of Egypt there was food. When all Egypt began to feel the famine, the people cried to Pharaoh for food. And then Pharaoh told all the Egyptians, go to Joseph and do what he tells you. When the famine had spread over the whole country, Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold grain to the Egyptians, for the famine was severe throughout Egypt. And all the world came to Egypt to buy grain from Joseph because the famine was severe everywhere. Thank you very much. Can you tell what job I used to do and that I really miss making PowerPoints? <laughs> Lucky Kairos who get to experience the Becky PowerPoint occasionally. And now you have, isn't it glorious? I'm so sorry to Lucy who actually made all of these slides look beautiful and I've just wrecked them by colouring them in. Um, okay, so here's what we're going to look at this morning. What has happened to Joseph by the end of this chapter, chapter 31? And what conclusions can we draw about how we read the Old Testament, about God, and about ourselves? So, we know that Pharaoh rewards Joseph for his insight and his explanation of the seven fat cows, seven thin cows dreams. And he's put in charge of the whole land. He's given trappings of royalty. He's given, been given chance to be seen riding in his sweet ride with people shouting, make way, in front of him. And the job he gets to do, he is perfectly suited for, because there has been nothing wasted in his life. All of his previous experiences have enabled him to be the right person at the right time, doing the right things. Because we see that God has been walking alongside him through the, frankly, awful situations that he's been in, in the pit, in the slavery, in the prison, God's restored him. God's brought him to a position where everything he's learnt, all the ways in which his integrity and his steadfast resilience have shaped him, make him right for this job. God has used all of Joseph's difficulties to make good things happen. He's totally redeemed Joseph and his life and changed it for the better. But how has he changed it for the better, Becky? I hear you ask. For example, he gets a new name. Now, nobody really knows what this name means. And commentators are fairly scathing to anybody who suggests one. I reckon there's a reasonable chance that he's got trips off the tongue, Zaphonath Panea as his new name, because it's easier for the Egyptians to accept him. It sounds better in an Egyptian tongue, maybe. Who knows what it means? But either way, it does show that he is properly accepted into Pharaoh's court and that they want to make him welcome and show that he is part of their culture now. He also gets a new wife who has a father who is a big shot priest somewhere in Egypt, which means that he is now well-connected. He's got a big shot father-in-law. 
he has children, two boys, Manasseh and Ephraim. And he explains why he calls them those names. So Manasseh, literally the Hebrew, and I spent some happy times looking up Hebrew meanings, um, ev evaporating the trouble. Literally, my troubles are forgotten. The troubles of my father's household are forgotten. They are blotted out. And that might seem a bit, oh, you've forgotten all about your father. Don't you, you know, recognize where you came from? Don't you know you're a Hebrew? It's not that sense. It's the sense of the pain that you experienced because of your father's household has been blotted out. And with that, it means the more than understandable desire for revenge that he might feel is also blotted out. And he's got Ephraim, fruitfulness through affliction. So in this season of life, these verses that we've got, we see that God has given him prosperity and blessing, even considering the affliction that he's received before. And in fact, it's because of all of these difficulties that he's endured that he receives the blessing of being elevated to this prince-like status. God's turned his sorrow into joy. What a lovely thing to celebrate in your child's name. We did something similar when our second child was born. Lovely Imogen. I was a teacher over in the East Riding. And um, turns out Imogen actually means in the Shakespearean, down with Ofsted. So what else goes well for Joseph? His prophetic interpretation comes true, which shows that he was actually hearing from God, which is important. Because it means that as, Joseph, as God uses Joseph's gifts and his talents in the coming year, we know that that's because he was told what was coming and he listened and he used it. Bethan spoke a lot last week about how Joseph heard what was coming and formulated a plan. He administrates the heck out of this famine. He doesn't just go, hey, seven years, let's just eat everything we possibly can, and then, oh dear, it's all going to be a little bit 5-2 diet in the next seven. He administrates it wisely and thoughtfully and with good effect. So Bethan last week spoke about how administration is a really important spiritual gift for today about how there is a real anointing on that gift for seeing a situation for what it is in a clear and organized way and being able to help others negotiate a path through what might otherwise be chaos. I'm going to go one further than just it's a helpful gift. I think it's really interesting. You look at the 12 brothers that Joseph is part of. Of those 12 brothers, it's not the kingly line of Judah who Jesus descends from in the end, that God uses in this story, is Joseph. And it's not Levi, his, one of his other brothers, the priestly line through whom God acts in this story. In this narrative, being a crack administrator is not just a helpful spiritual gift. When God wants a saviour for his people here, he uses an administrator. Hashtag, just saying, Hashtag administrators for the win. <laughs> and obviously, the best thing that happens to Joseph here, above all the trappings of royalty and the sweet chariots, his plan to prevent a famine is successful. So yes, as was prophesied, a famine comes, but there's plenty in Egypt. Why? Well, because Joseph listened to God, he served the people in whatever position he found himself in, and he obediently worked really hard. Yes, there are shiny rings, and there's people walking in front of his chariots. I'm sure that was lovely. But if we look from 46 to 48, it says, he goes out from Pharaoh, he travels around the whole of Egypt. That wasn't on HS2. That would have been hard work doing that. He organizes grain collections, and in each city... He puts the grain grown from the fields around it, reducing food miles. Very sustainable. Good boy. And he stores so much grain that he stops even keeping record. I do wonder what the people of Egypt thought about this stockpiling, just musing on it, really. Were they happy to give up their surplus as they'd grown it 
working off the sweat of their brow each year? Did they actually trust this young Hebrew and trust that the prophecy that he had brought was going to come true, that there would be this forecast downturn? Oh, I wonder whether they were a little bit resentful. This little youngling who turns up, he's only 30. That's, you know, a couple of years younger than me even. Pause for shock and horror. <laughs> were they are resentful that this young man who's taking their excess and is hoarding it and then selling it back to them when the fairing comes? Maybe. I don't know. But we do know that they come to be very grateful for Joseph's hard work. Because God uses this tremendous hard work to bring about salvation of the Egyptians and the neighbouring countries. And I guess this is my main thought for today. Sometimes God uses miracles to bring about rescue. The Red Sea, Moses walking through it on dry land. Rack, Shack and Benny, Shad, Rack, Me, Shack and Abednego for people who don't watch Veggie Tales, thrown into the fiery furnace and God rescues them from something miraculously. But quite often in the Bible, we see that God brings release and relief and rescue just through the hard work of the people he's called, doing their jobs faithfully and obediently. So what conclusions? About how we read the Old Testament, what conclusions to bring? So I have a set of Bible reading notes that love to make this point, particularly when you are reading about the Old Testament. You are not Joseph. I am not Joseph. It is very tempting when we read an Old Testament narrative to put ourselves into the role of the hero. God did this for Joseph. I am like Joseph, so he will do this for me. Every bad thing that has ever happened will come good and I will be king. No, that doesn't work and we know it doesn't. We don't get to look at Joseph's life and deduce that God is going to sort everything out to our design and in our timing just before the credits roll like a Hollywood film. And we know that because Joseph isn't like Moses either. Success and success in heavy air quotes and service in the Bible itself take many forms. Joseph starts as a shepherd, ends up in a palace. Moses starts life in a palace and then is brought low to being a shepherd for 40 years before finishing his life as a nomad, dying on the road before he sees the promised land. Yes, God absolutely can use rags to riches stories but he can also use the opposite. What do we conclude about God? So God takes Joseph and elevates him on high. So we know he can redeem any situation. God is powerful. I'm not saying that God is sitting up in heaven, looking down and going, oh, I sure do wish they would do what I say, but what are you going to do? They won't listen to me. No, God can and does act. He is powerful. He does have a plan and he will be faithful, and he cares deeply about his people. And what humans mean for evil, God can and does turn into good. Genesis 50, verse 20, which if you're up in Kairos in my team ever, we do as a little rap. You plotted evil against me, and God turned it into good. Genesis 50, verse 20. There's my team. There's my people. That's what I'm talking about. Mark Hutchinson has a lot to answer for. We love that verse because we love what it says about the goodness of God in the midst of dark times. But God's plan is a big, big, big plan. It's whole nations. It's hundreds of years. It's great purposes. And we tend to read the Bible very individualistically. What's gonna, God going to do to make it all right for me in my timing? Again, I'm not Joseph in the story. I do get to know and be loved by and serve the same God that Joseph did, but he doesn't promise it all turns out for me like it did for him. So what is this big plan? Is the answer Jesus? Well, yes, eventually. Yes, it is. 
God has an overarching plan to bless his people. And we see that all the way through Genesis. He has a plan and we see it worked out over centuries of narrative in Genesis. It's a plan to rescue and to bless his rebellious world through Abraham's family. They continually fail, but God is faithful to rescue and bless them. And he keeps taking evil and he keeps turning it into good because he wants that family to show the rest of the world what God is like. So that's tiny and you don't have to read all of it, but it's the rough idea of all these ways in which God's people are a bit rubbish and God still blesses them. God still turns up. Abraham and Sarah choose to speed up God's plan by conceiving a child through Sarah's handmaid. But does God wipe them out and go, oh, I was going to start such a good nation through you and you've just been rubbish. No, I'd stop, start again. Not you, some other dude in Canaan. No, he doesn't. He carries on blessing. He carries on using them. And we see Jacob, who's Abraham's grandson. Oh, he's a rotter. He cheats his dad, Isaac, to get his inheritance. He takes multiple wives and concubines, which you could argue wasn't necessarily his fault, but he stays with them. And God enables Jacob to wrestle with him and he chooses to bless him and he makes his sons, these 12 brothers that we're looking at, into a whole nation called by Jacob's new name, Israel. And we've already seen the last four weeks, Tom and Jen and Bethan and I think that's it, have shown us what a massive failure Joseph's family could be. They plot to kill their brother. They sell him into slavery. That's terrible. But through God's blessing, God, Joseph's hard work saves the nation and it saves a bunch of other people as well. But that is a spoiler for next week and Johnny will tell me off if I get into it. So I said this plan is all about Jesus. Obviously, it's all about Jesus. That's the Kairos answer. What's small and brown and has a big bushy tail? It's uh, Jesus, always. The conclusion we find about God here is that all of this is like a shadow, a picture pointing us towards Jesus. And there he is. He's turned up on my slides eventually. God is still rescuing his rebellious people through Jesus' death and resurrection. We, if we're really honest, every day rebel against what God wants us to do in how we think, how we act, how we speak. But praise God, it's Jesus that got punished for that. And we get to be forgiven. He is building a new family, members of his kingdom, whose job it is to demonstrate what living for God and with God really looks like. What does it look like to the outside world that we are God's family? Which leads us on to which conclusions can we draw about ourselves? Well, happily... We get to be a part of this big overarching plan to rescue and to bring blessing. We get to do that because we're his people. So having said, you are not Joseph, I'm slightly going to backtrack. We can still use him as a role model and learn from him. We just don't get to expect that our life turns out like his does. So all the aspects of Joseph's success, there we go back with our up and down, this is how his life turned out. All these aspects of his success in being part of God's big kingdom rescue plan, we can model too. So I've, I've scrubbed out the being sold as a slave because I don't like that. And I've scrubbed out being falsely accused of it in prison because I don't like that, but either. But let's have a look. Joseph receives words from God. We can absolutely do that. Joseph works hard. And he works with integrity. When Potiphar's wife snuck up to him and said, how about it? He could have gone, well, yeah, your husband's not home for another 25 minutes and you are quite pretty. But he doesn't. He works with real integrity. He says, no, I'm running away from that. I want nothing to do with that. Even if nobody ever finds out, that's not who I am. That's not who I want to be. He works hard whether he's rewarded or not. He's in the prison two full years prophecies and dreams that he reveals and he says oh when you get back to pharaoh 
dear cupbearer to the king, I don't suppose you'd mind putting in a good word for me because I'm not really supposed to be here and I'd quite like to get out. Cupbearer goes, gotcha, boss, absolutely will. Does he? No, not for a really long time, completely forgets. It takes Pharaoh having a dream for him to go, oh, yeah, there was this guy I was going to try and get off. Whether we are rewarded or not, we want to be people who work hard because that's what God calls us to. He's of service to his community and he uses his skills and his availability to bless others. I don't think there is any coincidence that it's this morning that Wendy came up to talk to us. And I'm not going to give you the hard sell that thou shalt join York neighbours, but how interesting that this was my message before I heard anything she had to say. We want to use our skills and our abilities to bless the community around us because that's God's big picture rescue plan. That's how he does it. He uses us as his children to show the rest of the world what living in his kingdom looks like. So, we get to be part of that kingdom breaking through. I don't know about you. I quite fancy that. That sounds good. That sounds like it gives me a purpose. Some days it does sound rubbish because it sounds like a day where I want to stay in bed and watch Netflix. But on my better days, on the days where I feel like I'm actually doing what God wants, that sounds amazing. A purpose-filled life. That's a precious gift. And I think that that's something that the outside world looks at us and goes, yes, that I see is different in you. Oh, you're going the wrong way, Becky. That's why it's going backwards. Silly woman. Okay, here's what I would love for us to do. I would like us to pray for each other. Where are we up to? 20 to 12. We've got a while. Right, instantly, some of you have gone, oh, holy heck, I am going to have to talk to the people around me. Yes, maybe a little bit. I would love for us to pray for each other's work. And please know I have put in the word work in heavy air quotes there. Because by work, I do not just mean the place that you drive to, you sit behind your desk and they give you a nice salary at the end, or a rubbish salary at the end of it. Because that isn't the case for everybody in the room in front of me. I also mean anything you do that is your purpose. So that might be in your house, it might be in your family, it might be in your community, it might be in paid work, it might be in voluntary work, it might be in your studies, it might be in all sorts of different spheres of your life. I would love for us to get the chance to pray for each other in that. What to pray? Well, like Joseph, it'd be great if as part of our work, whether that is super secular or we're paid ministers, it's so great if we hear from God. In fact, I think, and I was discussing this the other day, I think God giving us pictures and words and little nuggets of biblical truth is almost more useful for the non-Christians around us than it is for you beautiful people in front of us. That's not to say we don't want to hear from God on a Sunday morning. Absolutely, we do. But how much more powerful is it if you say to your colleague or your child or your neighbour, do you know, that's really interesting. I was praying about that the other day and... I feel like God says this into this situation. And they go, stop the press. That is exactly what I needed to hear. How much more powerful that is. So it would be so great if we can hear from God. And what does hearing from God sound like? It is strengthening, as Bethan said last week, encouraging and comforting. It is not generally the big stick bashing us on the head. Be great if we can pray for each other as we work to be of service. And dare I say, to work hard. You guys will have testimony in your lives of watching people in the workplace or in the family or in the community just diligently, obediently working hard and what a difference that makes to people who turn up, clock in, clock back out again, go home and you wonder, what exactly did they do all day? And it'd be so great if we can use our skills to bless others. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to get you to shuffle around and actually eyeball the people around you. 
share for literally two sentences. This is what I do for my job, or this is the area that I would like you to pray into. So for me, it might be, oh, an administrator for a charity. Did the fact I'm an administrator come out at all this morning? I don't know if I mentioned it. Um, but generally, where I want people praying for me is that I'm a chair of governors of a primary school, and that's where I really need to see God working. So that would probably be what I would want you to pray for. And then just pray anything good for that person into their lives, into their working lives, bearing in mind that work does not just mean paid work. What is their purpose and how can you pray good things into it? And I'm going to give you an out. If you are somebody for whom this is already causing a mild panic attack, can I possibly suggest to you that you adopt what Adrian Plass calls the shampoo prayer position, which is that you put your head forward like that and you look as though you are incredibly intently praying by your own self so that nobody else bothers you. Okay, so there's your little out if the idea of praying for each other really scares you. Twos or threes, not huge crowds, because otherwise you'll spend all your time sharing and not enough time praying. Why, CC, do we think that we might be able to do that? I know it's a big ask, but do we think we might be able to do that? Okay, you've got about 10 minutes or so. Um, move if you would like, shuffle around if you would like. Nothing else from me at this point but to pray blessing. So God, would you take this time that we're about to pray with each other and would you speak through it all? Amen.
Okay, can we just draw to a close in the next minute or so, please? Thank you. Good, okay. Well, thank you all for uh, being willing to uh, engage in that. Uh, as Becky said, it doesn't come naturally to everybody, but I just pray that's been a real blessing on you. This is our service coming towards the conclusion of the formal bit. Tea and coffee through the door there. Uh, if you've got children, please go and collect them. Um, there will be an opportunity, if you've got something on your mind or something in your heart, you really want more prayer for it, the prayer team will meet at the back of the church. Please do go and uh, speak to them. Um, thank you, Wendy, for that uh, great testimony, which is fitted so well with what Becky said uh, today. So, as you go th this week, just go in the power of Christ just go knowing that he's there with you. And don't forget the word of the song, because he lives, we can face tomorrow. If for some reason that isn't real to you, do speak to somebody who's been up front, somebody you can trust. Thank you. God bless. See you next week. <laughs>